as I'll ever be. Uh, you ready? Yeah? You know, duct tape does fix everything. It does. Yeah. Well, it's uh, another Easton podcast, and I'm here with my special guest and friend of decades, Mr. Jay Bars, the 1988 Olympic gold medalist and the first guy who made archery cool. <laughs> That's a stretch, but okay, I'll take it. Now, you got to admit, before Jay Bars, nobody had a flat top and nobody had headphones on the line and nobody was bopping to Motley Crue and a whole lot of other stuff. True. I was the first to do that, so... Um, I, do, I do have that going for me. All right. Well, a lot of people know who you are, and some of our listeners may not. But let's uh, back up and talk about Jay Bars and archery. And you can't tell the story of Jay Bars and archery without talking about your family. You came from an archery family. Your mom's an archer. Your stepdad's an archer. You grew up immersed in the sport. Yes and no. So, yeah, my, my biological father started shooting and uh joined an archery club and my mom got tired of going to tournaments and watching him shoot so she started shooting and was very good um i think she still holds some state records in florida and um so they drag us to archery tournaments and me and my little brother and it was either shoot the tournament or play in the sandbox and i wasn't a big fan of sandboxes and um so I thought, yeah, what the heck, I'll shoot archery. And I was pretty decent at it, had good hand-eye coordination, and I could usually win a trophy. So I thought, okay, this is cool. I'll do archery when we go to tournaments on the weekend. When people who know you know you're kind of an all-around athlete. You're talented in a lot of different sports. Yeah, I don't know if talent is the word, but, yeah, I've been capable. better. Capable? Capable, yeah. I Over my... Golf comes to mind. Tennis comes to mind. Yeah, I played and tennis. And with hand-eye coordination comes to mind. Yeah, I played tennis and baseball in high school, and I ski raced cross-country and alpine. Um, and I played basketball when I was in junior high. So, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of different sports and was pretty decent at them. So, you know, being an athletic, uh, having an athletic background and, and having that natural eye-hand coordination was probably helpful to you, picking up a bow. Oh, it absolutely helped, but what's cool about archery is it's not a sport you have to be an athlete, quote-unquote, to excel at. Um, there's a lot of great archers that can barely walk and chew gum. You're but, talking to one. <laughs> but, but they're great at the sport, you know. I mean, so that's what's neat about it is you don't have to be 6'10". You don't have to weigh 300 pounds. You don't have to bench press a million pounds. You can be just a normal average guy and or girl and excel at it. So, you know, the, the reality is, though, that uh, a lot of folks have started out where you started out with a family that shoots archery, you know, uh, having it be part of your normal routine. You took it a lot further, and we're going to talk about that shortly. But uh, let's, let's work your way up into high school. And, and was archery any part of that? Not really. So when, when I was nine, my parents divorced. And at 11, my mom remarried uh, my pop, the guy I consider my dad, because he did most of the raising and the beatings and all that good stuff. Um, and he was also an archer. He was in the archery club. That's where she met And, of met course, him. a lot of people know Jack Lyon. Jack Lyons. And your mom, yep. Dot. Dot. And, uh, you know. Meanest that. left-handed woman either side of the Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> um, She's a sweetheart. You know it. Five feet, two inches of screaming hell. <laughs> but... Uh, I can't cuss on this, right? Yeah, well, oh, yeah. God. You know, we're on iTunes now, so we actually had to Sweet. flip a switch that said, is it a clean podcast or an explicit podcast? And the clean switch is flipped. So Damn. if you do say something that uh, goes over the top, our editor, who's also named Jay, <laughs> will we'll take care of business. Okay, yeah. perfect. I'll try not to. But no, so yeah, the, so they shot and we lived in Florida at the time and there was a tournament every weekend and I didn't really go out and practice a whole lot, but I would always go shoot the tournaments and pop had always wanted to, to live in Colorado. And my mom, you know, is a, is a trooper and she's like, well, if we're going to do it, let's do it. We ain't getting any younger. So when I was almost 12, we packed up from Jacksonville, Florida. They bought a guest ranch at 8,500 feet just outside of Colorado. This is what Colorado. people in the East would call a dude ranch, I guess. A dude ranch. Yes, indeed. Um, we call it a guest ranch because it was not as much of a derogatory term. A dude out west is not a good thing yeah, to I, be. Yeah, I understand. Tom, from for the east, as you know. Yes, and, you are a dude you know, for sure. Yeah. But. <laughs> so, so yeah, we lived at 8,500 feet. The only way in or out in the wintertime was by snowmobiles. So my brother and I rode snowmobiles eight miles to the school bus and then cut the school bus eight miles into town. And Which sounds like fun, but I'll bet there were times when it maybe wasn't. Yeah, when it's 45 below zero and, you know, six feet of brand new snow and you're trying to get down there to go to school wasn't 
the best of times. I loved it. But uh, anyway, so there wasn't a tournament every weekend, so I quit quit shooting archery and I um, started ski racing because I was a small town of Kremlin, Colorado. They had a and I played basketball uh, one year in junior high, and I was such a midget that I quit playing. Um, so I ski raced second year I'd ever seen snow in my life, moving from Florida, and managed to letter in cross country and alpine. And you raced for the high school team, even though you were in eighth grade. Um, so I managed to letter for both of those, and then the next year they canceled the program. So I didn't do anything because I wasn't big enough to play football and I wasn't fast enough to run track and I didn't want to wrestle and um, that was pretty much all they had. So we moved from Montrose, or sorry, from Kremlin to Montrose. Bigger city. Bigger city, much bigger city. My, I had 24 people in my class in Kremlin and in Montrose where I graduated, we had 260. Oh, much bigger. Yeah, so I felt like I had moved to the big city. And um, so... We moved there, and they had a baseball team and a tennis team. And so I started playing baseball again because I'd played when I was a kid. What position did you play? I was a first baseman, mm-hmm. left-handed, um, no arm, good bat, but I couldn't hit it anywhere because I was so small. And I had a good glove, so I played first and then played on the tennis team. I never played organized tennis, but managed to end up being a number one doubles team, me and my partner. Um, and so I was a, played doubles and had a partial scholarship offer in tennis coming out of high school. But I couldn't afford to go to school. Which school did you have in mind at that time? I had no school in mind. Like, I don't plan farther ahead than I can see, usually. I'm not a big planner, (laughs) and uh, as anybody can tell you. Um, So I really wouldn't think about it. But between my junior and senior year in high school, it kind of dawned on me that when I graduated, I was going to have to get a job because I couldn't afford to go to college. And there was nothing else to do but get a job. I thought, ah, that's not good. So I thought, well, maybe I'll join the military and go through college that way. Because I have a lot of lot of uh, you got family. relatives who were Air Force generals, for yes, example. Yes, my my uncle was a general in the Air Force, and I've got uh, that's the uncle that used to tell us spooky things about Star Trek and how real some of this stuff really indeed, was. Yeah, he uh, he did a lot of interesting stuff in his life, and that's true story. Yeah, he uh, he said you'd be surprised how close we are on some of this stuff. <laughs> okay, this was back in the '60s. So yeah. anyway. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to join the military, and my parents uh, had kept shooting a little bit off and on, and they ran into Don Collier, who was off starting restarting the program at Colorado Northwestern Community College in beautiful Rangeley, Colorado. And there was 450 full-time students and about 1,100 part-time students, and they were restarting the archery program there. And uh, they were given full-ride scholarships to the junior college. And so I went, well, heck, I used to shoot archery and be pretty good at it, so I'd dug one of my mom's old carol bows out of the closet recurve and shot for two or three months got to where i could hit something again and went to a tournament that i knew he was going to be at and we shot together because we were the only two recurves in the whole tournament you're about 17 years old here uh yeah i was yeah 17 and um i beat him and he gave me a full ride scholarship if i wanted to shoot a bow and arrow set and i went sweet i'm an archer again (laughs) so so it was a path to uh, taking care of a problem, a financial problem, and it got you into junior college. Yeah, and it was also a way to put off work for another two years, which sure. I thought was a good thing to do. Um, and it dawned on me my junior year in high school when I got my first driver's license, and I was 5'3 and weighed 93 pounds, that I probably wasn't going to be a professional baseball player. Um, so I thought archery wasn't probably a bad idea. To, and again, got to go to go, go to school for free. You know, again, fundamentally, our sport is not one that requires a specific body type. It doesn't require a specific set of athletic skills. It does require perseverance, and it requires a certain mindset. And yours, we're going to talk about that. Actually, Steve Anderson and I talked about you last time we did our podcast about the subject of shot execution. And what we were talking about was how some people come into an archery tournament and they're completely focused on just, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to shoot my arrows and I'm going to sit there and I'm going to stay focused all the way through the tournament. And Jay Bars is a different guy. <laughs> yeah, there's no way you're going to stay focused for that long. We're going to talk gonna about happen. that coming up. But okay. uh, right now, we've got Jay Bars on a full ride scholarship in junior college in Colorado, getting in the van and going off to shoot against other schools every, what, every weekend? Uh, no, I mean, we shot quite a bit, you know, during the season, but living where we lived, everything was a drive. I mean, our closest tournament was, um, back then, I think we shot a tournament at Brigham Young University. So, uh, and that was a 10 hour drive. No, it was about a five and a half hour okay. drive. Most things were either Arizona or, uh, California. Uh-huh. So yeah, actually a lot of time on the road yeah. though. 
A lot of road trips. And the appropriate stories to go with them, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, you have no idea. It was a good time. Yeah, and I think sure. we, we probably will avoid <laughs> getting into some of the details that I am aware of, but uh, <laughs> it's just a wonder you survived some of those is all I can it say. It is true. It is true. So, yeah, so shot for Colorado Northwestern in my uh, sophomore year, won collegiate nationals for junior college, and we, the team just dominated. Um, I think our closest tournament a junior college got within like 450 points of us. I mean, we just crushed everybody. We had that good of a team. Um, and so we actually beat Arizona State, which is a four-year school, had not been beaten in I don't know how many years. And we actually beat them at a tournament. Um, and there were some heavy hitters at Arizona State at that time. I mean, you had you had Rob Coffold, I think, going. No, no, no. Coffold was going back east. It was uh, Rick McKinney and Lee Tinky or Lee Nicholas and uh-huh. Glenn Myers. Uh-huh. So that's two Olympians. Yeah. Um, Steve uh, Lewis may have been there. Oh yeah. Um, well, who else? There was a couple other guys that people hadn't heard of, but uh, good shooters. Good shooters. Um, Arizona State had a ridiculously good team for years. Kind of like A and M now, Texas A and M. I mean, maybe maybe at a higher level then than A and M is now, but but well, yeah, I mean, if you, you talk about figure ASU had Scott Kurtzen, Olympian, yeah. wow. Judy Adams, yeah. Olympian, yeah, Rick McKinney, Olympian, yeah, uh, Glenn Myers, Olympian, and eventually Jay Bars, Jay Bars, Olympian, um, Debbie Oaks, Olympian, uh, Allison Williamson, mm-hmm. Olympian, mm-hmm. Justin Hewish, Olympian. They all shot for Arizona State at one time or another. So yeah, the team was ridiculous. There's no question that a combination of the environment and the coaching and everything else that was available at Arizona State made for a, a unique combination that we don't even have today, I don't think. No. And the weather was good, too. So Well, that helped a lot. Pretty much shoot outside anytime you wanted. Yeah. And you did. So, um, at some point, Dick Tone figured out... That well, yeah. So, before that, so I won Collegiate Nationals my sophomore year and then figured I was going to have to get a job. And then Sherry Rhodes from ASU offered me a scholarship. And I thought, wow, I can put off work for two more years, get a bachelor's degree, and go to Arizona and shoot archery. So, that so was Sherry idea. Rhodes figured out who you were from what you did at Collegiate Nationals. Well, yeah, from, I mean, two years of shooting Collegiate Archery. Sure, she so she was. she was well acquainted with you by yeah. that point. Now, just to clarify, Sherry was running the program at Arizona State University at that time, right? Correct. Yeah. So, um, and you got to give Sherry a lot of credit for the for the results of that program over those oh, years. Oh, absolutely, I mean, yeah. It was just she took hugely. it over from Margaret Clan and... You know, never look back. And, it, yeah, it was a wildly successful program. Like I said, Great I don't remember coach. the exact numbers, but from sometime in the 60s until the early 90s when they canceled the program, they won all but, like, two or three men's and women's national titles every year, the team titles, and they won individual titles. I can't remember how many times. I mean, it was ridiculous. It was – nobody even came close. Dynasty. Of yeah, absolutely. Time. Yeah. So, okay, you've uh, you got yourself an offer to go to ASU. So, yeah, um, and about a year prior to that, Dick Tone had come out. Uh, he's a big bow hunter. My dad was a guiding outfitter in Colorado, and uh, he had come out hunting and had seen me shoot. And uh, when I kind of got back into it, I went and shot Las Vegas and the Joad, and then I shot a Joad tournament in uh, Phoenix, the Phoenix Open. And that was the only two Joe Ed tournaments I got to shoot because I was already 17. I turned 18 shortly thereafter. But he had seen me shoot those, and he had seen me shoot at the house. And he said, you know, if you ever decide to get serious about this, you know, I'd, I'll coach you. And I was thinking, yeah, okay, whatever. You live in Arizona. I live in Colorado. So, fine. So, uh, Sherry makes me this scholarship offer. So, I get home from graduating junior college on like a Wednesday. And I call Dick up. I'm like, hey, Sherry just offered me a scholarship. I'm coming to ASU. Um do you still, would you still be willing to coach me? He's like, yeah, when are you coming down? And I'm like, well, it's May and I'll be down in August when school starts. He goes, no, no, it's too late. We got to start working on stuff now. You got to get down here now. I'm like, Dick, I just got back from junior college. I got no place to live. I got no job. I got no nothing. He's like, I'll call you back. Click. And just hung up the phone. I'm like, all right. <laughs> About 15 minutes later, the phone rings. I pick it up. I'm like, hello. He goes, Jay Dicktone. Uh, I got you a job installing air conditioners with a buddy of mine uh, for his company. And uh, you can live with Diane and I at our house. I won't charge you any rent. So when can you get down here? You're installing air conditioners. In Phoenix, Arizona in the summertime. And I'm the skinny guy, so I'm the one in the attic and all the insulation at oh, 140 degrees. Yeah, it was great work. Helped me make a career choice. Um, so anyway, so he's like, when can you get down here? And I go, uh, Sunday? He goes, fine, see you then. Click. I'm literally holding the phone. I'm like, 
mom, I'm moving to Arizona. <laughs> and that Sunday I got in my car and drove to Arizona. What, what was going through your mind at that point? You didn't have anything to lose from your perspective, I gather. In fact, you had everything to gain. I mean, you were... Well, I mean, I was, wasn't even thinking about Olympics, world championships. I'm thinking about going to college, keeping my scholarship, winning collegiate nationals for the four-year division since I'd done it in the two-year division. Now you're about 19, 20, somewhere in this time frame? 19. 19. Um, I turned 20 down there that summer. Um, and, and so, I mean, that's all I'm thinking is collegiate nationals because that was the biggest thing I could, you know. I mean, I would shot some of the NAA stuff by then, but... That wasn't even on my radar screen. So this is basically your third, entering your third year of active shooting. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Fourth year. Yeah. Third, yeah, fourth year, something like that. Anyway. All right. so, so so now you've got Dick Tone coaching you. You're, yes. you're living at his house. You're shooting yes. in the backyard. Yeah, the first thing he did was increase my draw length by an inch and a half. Drop yeah, my he front, likes to do that. Oh, yeah, dropped my front shoulder, changed everything, and I had... I had made the olympic festival team for the west which right. was a pretty big deal the west had the best team at that time oh yeah you had you know i mean Rick McKinney, all the heavy Scott hitters, Kurtzen, yeah. blah 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 um the guys out of california that were all on the team so anyway i had made the team this was now you all got to remember this is back 1982 mm-hmm. i'd shot a 12 25 to made the last place on the top six guys so i was a six guy with a 12 25 on a fita shooting td2 Aluminum arrows, Kevlar string, you know, there wasn't a lot of 1300s being shot back then. Uh, matter of fact, in the U.S., Rick and Darrell were the only two that had done it at that point. A few Europeans. Yeah, but in the U.S., Rick yeah, and Yeah, I mean, in two. general, uh, just a few Europeans. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe maybe a Korean? Maybe not. I don't know. Not by that point, no. I don't know. So, so yeah, very rare. 1200 was still a decent score. Oh, back yeah, then. for sure. 1250 um, was, ooh. You yeah, know. so I was shooting 1220, and... Uh, and I'd only shot like three or four feet is because in you know college you didn't shoot those. And so I got to Dick's house and he changed all this stuff and I immediately started shooting 1180s. And I am like, this is bad. And at one point he actually, I was complaining so much, he got out his bow and went and beat me at 70 meters. I'm like, well, you're a great coach. You've got me to where you can beat me now. Thanks. And I think he alluded to that on your podcast <laughs> well what he did say was that he tore you down and started you up over again. well he said he tore me down till he could beat me which is basically what he did so i thought he meant literally like you know with a stick but. well he did that too but and i needed it but anyway so so yeah it was miserable that whole summer i was shooting i never broke 1200 that entire summer um went to nationals shot olympic festival shot something else i think i shot a world team trials or something that that year we're talking 82 here? Oh, sorry. No, it was, I uh, can't remember what it was. Oh, Olympic Festival. Shot all that. Shot horrible the whole summer. Just as an aside, I think one of the things that I really miss, and I, I'm sure you would agree, that that Olympic Festival setup that we had, back then it was National Sports Festival and then it became Olympic Festival sometime in the 80s. That was one of the greatest opportunities that I had as a shooter from the East and you had as a shooter from the West. Uh, I'd never ran into you until I ran into you at Olympic Festival. You know, you know, as it turns out, helping you out with some problems. But yeah, but that was a for a lot of shooters, wouldn't you say, a life changing experience? Oh, absolutely, because it was a a miniature Olympics in the United States. Yeah, so you they, got to go through opening ceremonies, and you got a uniform, well, and and you had to go through the trials process, right? You know, you you went and you you won your top four slots in your region six, six whatever it was, yeah. yeah. By the time I was uh, competing for it, I think that they had two uh, floating slots, and you had to win one of the top four in my region anyway, if I recall correctly. But neither here nor there. The point is, it was a a full up big event, right? You know, and, and it was designed to make you feel like you were at the Olympic game so when you made an Olympic team you knew that was going to be it had familiarity this pomp and circumstance and it was going to be the getting your uniforms and standing in line and going to the opening ceremony and the whole being with other athletes and the whole bit and it, yeah I thought it was a great program yeah and it's a shame that we don't have it anymore but that's don't mean to take us off in the weeds here I just want to <laughs> point out that it's a shame that we don't have something like yeah, that now it was a good program so getting back to where you're at, you're in Jay's, or sorry, you're in uh, Dick's backyard. Dick's backyard, and you're getting shooting beaten. horribly yeah. and uh, suffering through the summer. Yeah. And uh, then shot indoor season because even though I lived in Arizona, I came from Colorado. So when it was time for indoor season, you quit shooting outside and you went and shot indoors. So sure. I did. 
and started shooting a little better indoors and then the next spring first feeder came outside still shooting aluminum arrows and all that stuff and shot like a 1257 so my scores jumped over 30 points once you know i suffered through the process and stuck with what he told me and believed it and you know just kept grinding it out and when it finally came together i mean it came together big time so that was that would have been 83 um, 84. So you had to, you really had to bear down and, and live with it for a while, but it paid off. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's two things that just drive me nuts is people that want to get better, but don't want to change something. And people that have a coach, but don't do what they tell them to do because they either don't trust it or they think they know better. Well then don't have a coach. Yeah. Um, but if you're not willing to change, then that's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. I mean, it's ridiculous. But at that, you know, at that age and where you were in the world, that was an act of faith to a degree. But it always is. I mean, if you don't, the biggest thing about picking a coach to me is if it makes sense what he's saying or she's saying and just on a, on a common sense level, you can say, yeah, I buy into that then do it and get on with it. But there was never a time that ever crossed my mind. He wasn't trying to make me better Mm -hmm. like that never crossed my mind. But, you know, I coach a little bit now and, and I watch other, you know, archers react with interact with their coach. And I've watched some of the people Dick has coached and it's like, they're second guessing everything and they're questioning everything and they're not wanting to do it. And it's like, then why do you have a fricking coach? My pet peeve is when I see somebody who's got a coach, they're lucky enough to have a coach. And they get on the internet and they second guess their coach. And then a bunch of people who don't know them, never seen them, never met them, start weighing in with what they ought to be doing. It, it's, you know what? If I were a coach of somebody that were doing that, they wouldn't be my student anymore, personally. Exactly. Dick's too nice a guy. But yeah, that's true. It, it just, again, why have a coach? I mean, if you don't believe they're trying to make you better and everything they're doing, now are they going to do everything right? No. I mean, part of coaching is you're sometimes you're experimenting yeah there's an adjustment period there where you learn about well but i mean even once you i mean even as good as dick and i worked together there was times when he'd say well let's try this and we'd try it and it wouldn't work yeah but it made sense sure and sometimes he would tell me why he wanted me to do something and sometimes he wouldn't tell me because he knew i could affect the outcome if i knew what he was trying to get to sure so there was times when he just say do this i'd be like why he goes because i told you to i'm like okay he's got a good reason and i would do it and it's not blind faith but it's that's what the coach is for. If you knew better, you wouldn't need the coach. Obviously, you don't know it, so listen to what your dang coach is saying because that's why they're there. If you don't have that kind of faith in them, then you shouldn't have them as a coach. It's just it's crazy. You're just fighting yourself if you're not doing the program, you know, and if you don't, again, believe it from the beginning, if it doesn't make sense to you, then that's probably not the coach for you. Um. But everything Dick told me the whole time, even though when I was shooting crappy in the beginning, it all made sense to me. Like, he kept it a very simple, clean, use the least amount of muscles, be as relaxed as you could. That all made sense to me. Sure. And so, of course, I'm going to do it. But I just watch people fight their coaches, and it's like, why bother? So back in the backyard in the Phoenix suburb, you're rapidly approaching a fork in the road of the path of J-bars and college and university. Because at a certain point, you're looking at this situation of an impending Olympic Games, and you're thinking to yourself, perhaps, what do I need to do to get ready for this, Dick? Well, actually, no. In 84, I wanted to win collegiate nationals. That was going to be my last year. That was your goal? Yep. Collegiate Nationals, that was it. That's all I wanted to do. And and about six months, I had qualified for the trial. Because clearly the Los Angeles games weren't on your radar for... No, God, no. I hadn't made any kind of team other than Olympic Festival. I mean, you know, I'd shot a world team trials. I'd shot a Pan Am team trials and never came close. Well, you think about those guys that were there, right? You Rick and Daryl Pace, <laughs> yeah, and, McKinney, and, Darryl Pace and Glenn Myers. You know, Ed Eliason, yeah, Jerry Polipchuk, I mean, the, the Ray list, Burke. Just a very intimidating group of guys. Yeah, Larry Smith. Sure. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, I wasn't even on my radar. And Dick, about six months before the trials, goes, you know, you can make that Olympic team. <laughs> He's talking about the 84? <laughs> yeah, no way. Wow. Right. He goes, no, I'm serious. I'm like, yeah, no. Uh, all I if only you'd listened. Well, I don't know, because Daryl was there. True I enough. think it worked out better, me not going till 88. 
I really do. Don't want to argue that. So, I mean, again, total fluke. But anyway, he's so he's like, you could make this team. I'm like, yeah, you're insane. So I went to Collegiate Nationals and won them. And I had qualified for the trials, and they were the next week. So I just stayed in Oxford, and we shot the Olympic trials. And it was a double feeder. And after the first two days, Rick was in, Daryl was in first, Rick was in second, and I was in third. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> I could actually make this Olympic team. And then, of course, reality set in, and I promptly dropped that the next, the third day at 70 meters, I dropped to like fifth or sixth. You sure showed up on a lot of people's radar then, though. Yeah. And I stayed at fifth or sixth. I think I finished sixth, finished the trials at sixth. Um, but I came back and I went, dang, I think I can make an Olympic team. And Dick That's said, when the light came on, huh? Dick goes, yeah, no kidding. That's what I've been trying to tell you. And if you'd stayed focused through that, maybe, you know, things would have been different. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not as successful. Well, exactly. That's why I said I think I was better off not to make the 84 team because Daryl, that was his second gold medal, and he was the man by a mile back then. And I wouldn't have stood a chance of winning a medal. Sure. But I think if you look at people that have – men that have won the Olympic gold medal, the vast majority – have done it on their first time. Yes, you're right. Except for Simon Fairweather, every single Olympic gold medalist has done it at their first time at the Olympic Games. Correct. Except for Daryl, of course, Who's repeating. Right. But that's a repeat. That's different. Right. Well, and Simon, to be fair, he pretty much quit shooting he was a different and came guy. back. He was a different so person. So completely different guy. I mean, not, the way he not was just built, mentally, but yeah, exactly. The whole bit. I mean, he had, yeah, he had stopped shooting for I don't know how long and then come back. So it was almost like being back for the first no, time not almost i'd say it was because he went from, arguably he went from having a massive upper body you know like a power lifter type when he body. won the world in 91 that's right and yeah. then he came back like a marathon runner yep and because he was running marathons correct so you know it was uh, a different guy so i would say that that one anomaly but you look at every other olympic male gold medalist in our sport it's the first time they've been to the games correct. it's uh, so john I, williams and Daryl Pace, and then Daryl Pace, and then Tommy Poikalainen, and then, you know, um, 84 was uh, Daryl Pace again. No, it was, it was it was Johnny Williams, Daryl Pace. Darryl Pace. We boycotted in 80, yeah. so it was Tommy Poikalainen, <laughs> Daryl Pace in 84, me in 88, Justin Hewish, or sorry, uh, uh, Simon, uh, Sebastian Flute, right. Justin Hewish. Right. And Simon the list Fairway. goes on, right? And you but, know, same for same for o four, same for o eight. Point and being, they've won it on their first time, so I think it actually was better for me not to have made the eighty four. Sure. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so I was uh, back training and really started to focus on making the eighty eight Olympic team. And as a function of the light coming on during that previous trials, yes. as much as anything else, huh? Yeah, and Dick convincing me. Sure. Um, okay, so now you've got to set forward a. a a game plan of some kind. You've got a, a roadmap to get to the games. And not just get to the games, I'm, I'm pointing out, but also, you know, I mean, it's one thing to get to the games and another thing to win. Yeah, that's two different things. If your goal is to get to the Olympic Games, the odds of you winning it are slim. Your yep. goal has to be to win the gold medal. Exactly. And then getting to the games is just something you have to do. It's a signpost. Correct. So Now about 1985-ish. Yeah, you've, you've shot really well at the Olympic trials, mm -hmm. you know, finished in the top ten. Top five. Six, yeah. six. I think yeah, I finished six. sixth. Well, that's top ten. <laughs> and and now you're you're looking at this and going, dang, Dick Tone was right. My coach was right. And you know what? If I really apply myself and learn my lesson from what I did last time, I can not just make this Olympic team. I can go and win. Well, at first I was thinking I'd make the Olympic team. Naturally. Because Rick and Daryl are still winning everything. Um, you know, Rick won the – World Championship in 83. Darryl, Rick McKinney, for Rick those of McKinney us who aren't. won the World Championship in 83. Daryl won the gold medal at the Olympics in 84. Rick won the silver medal in 84. And Rick won the uh, World Championships in 85. And these guys were, you know, they were aliens oh, compared yeah. to the rest of the world. I mean, they were shooting 100 points or more above anybody else. And not to take anything away from our friend Tommy Poikalainen, but honestly, if Daryl had been there in 1980... Odds are. Odds are. If you were a betting man... Yeah. He'd have probably won it. Because um, he was shooting 100 points higher on average than anybody. And a double feet, yeah, for yeah. sure. So so anyway, so I'm starting to think, you know, I, can, I could actually pull this off. I could be the third guy. Now, did you team. know there was such a thing as a grand feet in the works? No. At that point? No. No, no, no. You were planning on a feet around. On a oh, absolutely. 144 arrows, 36 arrows at four distances, 90, 70, 50, and 30 meters. 
Those would be the it's ones. how we used to do it. Yep. Back in my day. Yeah, <laughs> So <laughs> I've been promising myself I won't use that line. Yeah. So anyway, so you know I'm working down at Fiesta Archery and, and Fiesta Archery is a shop in Arizona. Was was a shop in Arizona. Uh, was that Al Henderson's shop originally? No, different shop. No. Okay. Kevin Erlinson. Gotcha. Oh yeah, Kevin yeah. Erlinson from eventually from Frontier Archery. Correct. Well, no, from Frontier Archery. Ah, his to, mom owned it. Gotcha. And his dad, and so he came to Arizona and started his own place. Okay. So anyway, so. I'm working there and shooting archery and um, pretty much uh, it was time to fish or cut bait. And I don't know if Dick put Kevin up to it. I I think they did. I think they colluded together. But one day in early 86, I walk into work and Kevin goes, I'm going to have to let you go. (laughs) Like out of the blue. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, I'm going to have to let you go from the shop. And there was only three of us working there. So it wasn't like, you know, he was overloaded with employees. Um, And I'm 99% sure it was Dick saying, look, this guy needs to just start focusing on archery and only archery. And I was still finishing up my degree because if you were still in your catalog and you were still going to school, your scholarship carried on until you graduated. You were matriculated. Yes, whatever that means. Um, So, uh, come on, I, I graduated with a business degree. I don't have a lot of knowledge here. So anyway... So Dick said, well, you know, this is perfect. You need to decide to get serious about this. And so you can work for Cavalier and you can assemble arrow rests and plungers and I'll pay you piecework. So however many you can make. And I found out I was pretty quick at it. So I could make about 10 bucks an hour. Kind of sit in front of the TV and put people's uh, plungers together. Plungers and and, uh, Olympians. T-300s and Olympians. Olympians, man. I could fly on those things. So anyway, so I'm like, all right, well, so I get fired. And so Dick's like, you know, you're not really get serious about this if you're going to do it. It was, you know, two and a half years away, blah, blah, blah. So I went, all right. So I was 13 hours short of my degree. I had one semester left on a full-ride scholarship, and I dropped out of school. Big risk. To train a full, <laughs> full-time for the Olympic Games. Now, now that, you still have the use of facilities. Oh, yeah. But that left-handed woman that is my mother, the one I told you about that was the meanest. Mm, yeah, I bet she wasn't she happy. She was not impressed with my decision-making abilities at that point. She's only 5'2 on a good day, and uh, I was right at six foot tall, and she was not impressed and said, grabbed me by my collar and pulled me down to her level and said, you will go back and finish school after the Olympic Games. And I said, yes, ma'am, I will, I promise. And you did. Well, not till after the 92 Olympics. Yeah, but, <laughs> but you still did. Eventually I went back. So I dropped out of school, started working for Cavalier, and started shooting archery full time. And... That's when Dick and I sat down and really got serious about mapping out what's it going to take to make the Olympic team and and win the gold medal. And that's what we did. So here we are. We're in Phoenix, Arizona. Jay Bars has just irritated five foot two of, of the sweetest but meanest mother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dot was not happy. No. What did Jack say? You know, Pop's Pop. He's, he didn't care. Yeah. Okay. You know? I mean, he was, he was, he had equanimity about it. Well, either that or he just lets mom do all the I see. ass whoopings. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to have to flip on the explicit label. All right. But seriously, um, you know, this is a big decision. I mean, it's, it's a uh, high risk, high reward. You know, it really wasn't for me because honestly, I was in school to shoot archery. Huh. It was an ends to a means. And I kept my grades good enough to not lose my scholarship and, was never really so your focus was archery absolutely yeah you know and nothing wrong with that and um because i mean my grades were not stellar interestingly enough after 92 when i went back you know i think my gpa when i when i left was like a 2.2 or something And when i went back all the classes i took to finish my degree and a couple i picked up in junior college for the new catalog i had to be under and stuff i had like a 3.8 you improved well, I was a little more focused on school and not sure. on shooting bows and arrows, yeah. so it makes a difference. Plus, I was a little older, a little more mature, uh, had a different mindset. But now, yeah, I was not. I was not a good student of. But there was a lot of sacrifice in there. I mean, you know, if you think about it from the standpoint, not necessarily of career earnings or anything like that. I mean, you know, you were you were living from cushion plunger to cushion plunger for oh, a while. Oh, absolutely. There. Yeah, I mean. You know. It was not a glamorous lifestyle, but it was awesome. I mean, I, you know, once I started getting serious in 86 and 
shot my first 1300 and started making some teams and you know i was getting to travel the world and somebody else was paying for it and dick found a friend of his who managed some apartment complexes and they gave me an apartment for half price and then i had roommate that would pay for most of it and towards the end it was my little brother because he worked for america west and so he was uh never there but was paying most of the rent because <laughs> he had a job and i didn't and you know i drove a 68 volkswagen carmen Ghia and i would eat my breakfast and go shoot archery till lunch then i would swing by dick and diane's house to get some coaching and she would feel sorry for me and feed me lunch for free and then i'd go back and shoot some more and then i'd swing by my parents house or because they were in arizona at that time or my girlfriend's house and they would feed me dinner so you know three months before the games they shut my phone off because i couldn't afford to pay the bill um, you had your choice between your electric bill and your phone bill exactly and tv was way more important at that time so so you kept the electricity on. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, but I, I mean, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And people talk about sacrifice. I understand where they're coming from. But in my mind, it wasn't a sacrifice because it was what I chose to do. Okay. So to me, you have choices. If if you choose a path and you feel like you're sacrificing something, then you probably made the wrong choice. Because I wanted to be no place else than where I was shooting my bow and arrow set traveling the world and trying to make the Olympic team and it didn't matter how much money I had or didn't have it was all about wanting to do that and so it was never a sacrifice to me because it was where I wanted to be what was a typical training day like for J-Bars um you get up at what time well for me if I was left to my own devices I would always fall in the same pattern I'd stay up making plungers till about two o'clock in the morning go to bed i'd get up about 8 30 grab some breakfast go to the field shoot from 9 9 30 and breakfast for you if i'm not mistaken would have been a a, a, a glass of carnation instant breakfast carnation right? a bre- or a bowl of wheaties okay. i'm one of the few people that actually ate wheaties a bowl of wheaties or a glass of carnation, carnation instant, instant breakfast. breakfast to the field um i'd shoot till lunchtime um now the field was at asu yep at ASU, great field. Um, people could pretty much set their watch by where I was standing on the field at any particular yeah. <laughs> time. 10 o'clock, you're starting 70 nine, meters, yeah, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So I would shoot till lunchtime. You shot a feet around? Uh, usually I would, day? yeah. Um, I On average, I shot three to 400 arrows a day. That was, I mean, no less than 300 would leave my bow. Five days a week, six days a week? Pretty much every day if I was in town. If I, I wasn't see. shooting a tournament, it was every day. Didn't take any time off? Rarely rarely took days off because i i loved it i just love standing there flinging arrows i mean i really enjoyed it um so I, yeah i would shoot till lunch and i'd go grab some lunch and then i'd come back to the field and shoot till i thought i'd shot enough or i got bored and which wasn't very often and uh then i'd go get dinner and like i said 300 was pretty much the minimum so a double feed a, a day and the mm-hmm. maximum uh, there was days i shot well over 900 not many, but a few. Um, and it usually was because it was I wasn't paying attention and I was out there shooting my normal thing. And then somebody would show up and go, hey, shoot with me for a little while. So I'd shoot with one of my buddies. and we'd an go, incentive. Yeah, we'd go get some lunch. And then I'd come back and we'd finish shooting. I'd just about going to wrap it up. And somebody else would show up and go, oh, I'll stay and shoot some more. And so I'd stay and shoot a little while longer and then go get some dinner. And then they'd come back out and we'd be finishing up. And then somebody else would show up and, hey, let's shoot a little. And next thing I know, I'd shot. 900 ish was mark uh, mark mckinney around at those times or no, no. mark had already left later. oh he yeah. already he was already done yeah, he'd already been done at asu so and properly then, gainfully employed by that point. yes he was back in indiana Our no friend. actually no he was uh, in law school well but he eventually became the district attorney of a large metropolitan area eh, if you can consider monthly large well yeah. <laughs> larger than well larger than uh rangely colorado <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> all right so the Typical day is lots of shooting, working on working on making plungers at night, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, and shooting and, every tournament I could get to. If there was any tournament anywhere, any time I could get to it, I shot it. So that was it. Immersed in archery, hundred percent, and that's and loved every minute of it. So now you've picked up a mental management program during this time frame. Yeah, in. Um, Probably late 85, early 86, The uh, I had been making the U.S. archery team, so the USAT team, top men and women, top 10 men, top 10 women, and so Rick and Daryl and Ed and, you know, the usual suspects. And um, 
at one of the camps, Rick was kind of helping run the camps and they kept trying to teach us this mental training stuff, you know, and, um, so it would have had to have been early 86 and, uh, Rick sitting there with the top 10 guys in the country and he comes out with, you know, we bring you to these camps every year and we teach you how to eat and we teach you how to train and we, you know, teach you how to do mental training and all of y'all just go home and do what you've always done. He goes, if you do what you always done, you get what you always got. He goes, I mental train. I do mental training, and I'm not worried about any of y'all ever beating me. And I'm Made like, you mad, didn't it? Uh, well, it's a bold statement when the top ten guys in the country are sitting there. And then I thought a minute, and I went, well, he won the world in 83. He won the silver medal at the Olympics in 84. He won the world in 85. Hmm. Maybe he's on to something. But I did not believe the mental training thing at all. I thought you just need to shoot more arrows. Um so my philosophy was, all right, I'm tired of hearing about it, so I'm going to do this mental training thing they're talking about. I'm going to prove it doesn't work, and then they will get off my back and let me go back to shooting arrows. So that was my attitude going into this, was I'm going to prove this doesn't work. And so I chose to do positive affirmations, where you write down on a 3 by 5 card, I enjoy and am comfortable shooting small, strong, smooth shots in the wind, or I enjoy them comfortable shooting scores over 1340, or I enjoy them comfortable shooting distance scores of XYZ. And or, you went through the 20 something day period and you read these things. Every oh no, day more and, than that. I, yeah. it was months and months. of No, reading. but I, I mean, there's, you know, each card gets its 20 days. Or no, whatever. no, no, no. I had the same cards until I accomplished what was on that card. Really? Absolutely. Yep. Um, so, I mean, there were several cards I kept all the time. Uh, I enjoy them comfortable allowing my side pin to have its natural arc of movement. Well, there's one card that um, still has a place well, of honor. Well, yeah, here. that one I stuck in my my uh, bathroom mirror, so I'd see it every day, uh, multiple times. And I wrote, uh, "I will be on the 1988 Olympic team," and then went back about a month later and wrote, "And win the gold medal." And, and that put, card is sitting. It's in my office. In um, your office right now. Yeah, my little brother uh, framed it and presented it to me when I got back from the '88 games. Nice. I had actually read it so many times I forgot it was there. I read it every, you know, of course, every time you walk by the bathroom mirror, I would read it. But and that was the strategy. You'd put it on your refrigerator or yeah, you'd put absolutely. it on your bathroom, but places the, you were going to see it. Right. But the ones I carried with me, um, you know, I enjoyed them comfortable beating Rick McKinney and Daryl Pace because <laughs> I knew if I could beat those two guys, I could beat anybody. And so if a score on a card, if I accomplished that score and started shooting that score regularly, then I would bump it up. Um but other things, like with the sight pin or with shooting strong, smooth shots in the wind, that's something I always was working on and always wanted to be working on. So I never changed those cards, ever. Because they were fundamentals. Correct. And so I started that in early 86. That was really the only thing I changed. And in the summer of 86, when I left to go shoot Olympic Festival – nationals and then there was one other tournament after that there was three tournaments in a row and as i'm walking out of dick tone's house because he's taking me to the airport i wasn't living with him at the time but as he's as i'm walking out of his house to take me to the airport i looked at him i go if i get two good days of weather i'm going to shoot a 1300 i don't know where that came from i don't know why i said it there's only been three guys in the u.s to do it rick daryl and ed in 86 ed eliason yes 72 olympian and uh Dick looks at me and goes, well, save your scorecard because I want it. That's all he said. And I'm like, okay. But it was like I just knew I was going to do it. And so at Olympic Festival, wind was blowing, didn't shoot that well. First feed at Nationals, um, first two days, or first day of the FIDA after 90 and 70, I'm like five or six up on a 1,300 pace. At the end of 50, I'm 10 up on 1,300. All I got to do is shoot a 340. This was Oklahoma? No, this was in – at nationals. Oh, in, I'm uh, sorry. I thought in it was Oxford. Adjustable. Okay. And uh, so at 30 meters, I got 10 points to play with. I walk up there in a 340. I mean, I could always shoot three. Get down to the last arrow, and I have to shoot a 10 to shoot a 1300 on the nose. And I did. I shot a 10. What shot was going through your mind when you had to shoot that arrow? What an idiot I was for. For letting it get down for letting it a get, 10? Yeah, it shouldn't even. I mean, come on, 340? Please. At that, like, no. That, you know, a bad day was a 346, 348, you know. But the wind was blowing. No. I was gagging as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really wasn't. I just wasn't. I think I was just trying too hard, and so I was just barely missing. So, I mean, my arrows weren't. You came like up I against was, your comfort zone a little bit? 
A little. Well, yeah, I'd never done it in a tournament. Okay. I'd only done it twice in practice. So you shot the arrow, and it was a. I buried it. It was a ten, and shot a thirteen hundred on the button, and I was like, "Wow, that was actually easier than I thought it would be." Once it was over. Was that the high score? Um, no, I think Rick was still. Rick had shot at thirteen oh, thirteen ten, thirteen something. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think Daryl had two. Probably not a good day for them by their standards, but that's how you. Well, no, back you know. then again, aluminum. Air, no, oh, yeah. no, well, wait. no, they were no, shooting. We were ACs. shooting ACs back then. Yeah, so we were shooting ACs, but still original uh, ACs, not ACEs. Correct. And I was the fourth guy in the U.S. to ever shoot a thirteen hundred. Right. And that was eighty six. So. So after Rick, Daryl, Ed, Ed, and Jay, me. Here we go. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I just opened the floodgate. I mean, I. Jay just started coming. I shot back-to-back 1300s in Mexico at the Mexican Olympic Festival, and then I just, you know, once I did it one time, then it was just like, boom, it just took off. Yeah, it's like breaking the four-minute mile or any other mental barrier. Once you've done it, it's easier. So, you know, the, the, the thing that people have to recognize, though, is that they maybe limit themselves by holding out a round number like 1300. You know, uh, you could argue it's better to come up with a goal of 1305 or 1310. Oh, absolutely. Give but, yourself a little bit of leeway. There. Yeah, but no yeah. matter what, I think people still fixate on that on that whole number. Well, now, and, now and of course, me, it's a different number. <laughs> it's right. a higher number. For me, written on my... Uh, there's still a lot of people who would love to shoot a 1300. Absolutely. But written on my card, I think it was like 1310 or 1312. I can't remember what it was, but it was definitely over 1300. It just happened to come down to... I did it on the nose. You know, one of the shames of not having the uh, feet around around anymore, per se. I mean, it's still around, but, you know, it's it's harder and harder to find a tournament that features it, is that you don't have those those iconic numbers, you know, that we had in the past. The, the 1,300 benchmark, the 1,200 benchmark, the, the star scores, you know. Yeah, the, well, now it's, you know, all on 720 rounds. So, right. You know, 660, 650, 680, you know. Yep. Just different round. So at this point, you're, you've uh, broken the 1,300 barrier, and you've got an Olympic trials looming. Yeah. Two years away. That's a lot of time. Well, <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds more feet of rounds being shot. Yep. And then in 87, they well, kind of uh, late well, 86, early 87, they came out with the grand feet. Did you start getting some equipment support or some financial support oh, yeah. at this point? Yeah. Um, not financial, really, but. Um, yeah, Earl Hoyt never paid anybody. No, but Earl Hoyt did pick up some plane tickets for me. Uh-huh. Um, and strictly because Dick Tone asked him to. I mean, it wasn't like he normally, you know, he helped Daryl and he helped other people, but there wasn't a set program. And also back then you had to be, quote, unquote, an amateur. So you really couldn't get money. Right. Officially. Yeah, um, it was in the rules. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, I had, you know, he picked up a couple of plane tickets for me and, and did some other things. But yeah, I mean, I got... I was getting, because of being on USAT, you know, you got your bows and you got your arrows right. and, you know, that type of stuff. Acura uh, 300 sights, sights and yep. stabilizers and whatnot. Yep. yep. So that took care of the need for, for getting equipment. Equipment. At that point, Absolutely. it wasn't much of a problem for you. No. Had you adopted the yellow bow by this point? Um, actually, I shot yellow because that's my favorite color up through the TD3. So TD2, TD3, because they offered yellow when the gold medalist or what we call the td4 came out they didn't offer yellow but they had this kind of metal fleck gold yeah so i shot that because that was the emerald very yeah. expensive paint and i <laughs> you know i wasn't i wasn't somebody enough to ask for a yellow one back then so i hadn't really made made my name yet so i shot the gold color and then at the trials in 88 they had painted me one that they thought was going to be really cool, but it was kind of a orangey, yellowish with huge metal flake in it. You know, kind of thing like, Rick would have shot, maybe. Almost. I was like, Rick but, was famous for his orange bows. Yes. And I was like, look, I, I just wanted just a plain yellow bow. I really didn't want anything this fancy. I just want just that old yellow you used to make back in the day. So when I made the team in, in 88, they did paint me a yellow riser that I wanted you know as a congratulations and sent it to me and I couldn't wait and I got it out of the box and it was right handed <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't win yeah I had some fun with that I called him up I'm like I can't remember who I talked to at Hoyt but whoever it was it was I in charge it of that and uh well, by now, you know, Easton owned it, and it was oh. here in Salt Lake, and so I, I called up. Well, I, no, it wasn't actually here in Salt Lake by that point. It was it was still, uh, distribution was in Salt Lake. You're right. No, it was in Salt Lake. Are it you was, sure? Yes, it was 88? over. 
Absolutely. It was over in the Hoyt side. The old Hoyt side. Yeah. Or Easton side, I mean. Uh, you're right. So, yeah, it was it, it was up in at, uh, Salt Lake. Yeah, so you're right. I can't remember who I talked to, but it was whoever was in charge, and, and I was... Uh, I was messing with him. I got him, got him on the phone. I'm like, "Hey, I got that new Hoyt bow. It's ye- the ye- new yellow bow. I really like it, but I'm fairly sure Yamaha knows that I'm left-handed." And there's this long pause, and he's like, "What?" I go, "I'm fairly sure Yamaha knows I'm left-handed. And if I ask them for a yellow bow, they'd probably send me a left-handed yellow bow." And he's like, "What?" We didn't. I go, yeah, you sent me a right hand. But he's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, we'll get you another painted right now. <laughs> Send it out. <laughs> so I was, I couldn't resist. It was too much fun. Winning friends and influencing people. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that was when I got back to shooting just plain old yellow was after I'd made the team. Well, it was iconic by the time the, uh, by the, time the games were over and Hoyt had put out that heavy medalist poster. You got a lot of media attention during the games, even before you won. Because of your style, you know, you brought a certain style to the field and people were paying attention to it. Yeah, I mean, when you know, before the games, it was all about Rick and Daryl because they're Rick and Daryl, and I, I get that. And then about Denise Parker because she was a 14 year old oh, yeah. on her first Olympic team. And she was, yeah, and she was the youngest U.S. Olympian there of all the sports. 14 at that time. Yes. So they, they got all the pre tournament, you know, stuff. But once the tournament started and the media saw me with my headphones on and playing my air guitar and just being an idiot. Then it kind of switched. Plus, I was shooting fairly well. So then it was kind of like, okay, who is this guy, and why is he doing something so much different than everybody else? Because everybody else is focused, and they're right. It's our serious, and they're quiet. And they're, yeah, well, you know, and you were different. You were. You were sitting there. You were playing the air guitar. You're listening to Motley Crue. You're bopping your head back and forth, and you got the little yellow headphones in your head. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, to me it was, why would I want to sit here and realize I'm actually at the Olympic Games under all this pressure? I would rather be doing something completely different and when it was time to get on the line and be focused, then I could. The rest of the time, you can't affect anything that's going to happen except when you're on the line shooting arrows. And I wanted to be there the shortest amount of time possible, which is one of the reasons I shot as fast as I did. So get up there, shoot your arrows, get done, get off the line. You were often the first guy it. off, usually the first guy off Always. the line. Yeah. I, back then you had two and a half minutes to shoot three arrows, and my normal pace was 45 to 50 seconds. That was A, B, C, D. Uh, some term usually it was just a b but yeah at the games it was just a b yeah but yeah so i mean 45 seconds i'm sitting in my chair so it's a grand feat you're shooting three arrow ends yeah that started in 87 at the worlds and i won the bronze medal there which gave me a lot of confidence going you know to 88 um but yeah so you spent a lot of time visualizing what the games were going to be like at least you know the promotional materials of the time seem to seem to emphasize that you spent a lot of time you know um thinking about what the venue would even smell like you know that kind of thing yeah absolutely when i was shooting in arizona you know when it's you hit the field in the morning it's already 100 degrees and that's as cool as it's gonna be all day you know and so i would have to do things to make myself stay motivated and stay out there and so one of them was i'd pretend i was at the olympic games and i'd kind of chuckle to myself because i had never made a team before and i'd pretend in my mind that i had made it to the final pass and there's only eight of us left, and I'm tied with the other seven guys, and there's three arrows left to shoot, and we're at 90 meters, and this is for the gold medal. And I did it enough times that I could literally get butterflies in my stomach, and I could almost get goosebumps on my arms at 110 degrees outside. Get the adrenaline going. Absolutely. And But what I tell myself is all you got to do is just shoot three good arrows. Doesn't matter where they go. Just execute three good shots with you know the right rhythm and timing, and you're going to win the Olympic Games. And then I'd... You know, shoot my three arrows, and I'd hear the crowd go wild, and I'd be dancing around the field at ASU, and people walking by the people field. People are wondering what's, what's they're, going They're on. thinking, please take that weapon away from that child. He's going to hurt someone. Mm. The boy has lost his mind. But you made the effort. You really, you but, really I mean, visualized it. Yeah, and I did that, I don't know, who knows how many thousand times before the games. And so, you know, when I got to the games and I got down to those last three arrows, it truly was, all I got to do is execute three good shots. I'm going to ask a stupid question. You did all this preparation, years of work. You get to the Olympic trials in Oxford, Ohio. Was there any doubt you were going to make that team? Were you, were no. you stressed out about it? No. I wasn't. I absolutely wasn't. I hadn't. So that was a road, that was a, that was a signpost on your way. Absolutely. You already knew you were on your way. Yeah. I, part of it was, I mean, I shot well in 87, won the bronze at the world championship. Well, made the world team first. I was my first world team. Then I won the bronze. And then leading up to the Olympic trials, I hadn't lost to Rick or Darrell 
that whole year leading up to the trials. So you were number one um, with a bullet. Yeah, so I was feeling really good about it. And Dick knew that, so he wanted to keep me focused. So the way the trials worked was you shot a, a FIDA, and you got one point for first, two points for second, three points for third, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then you shot the grand FIDA, starting with the top 24. And if you won the pass, you got one point. Second was two points. Third was three points. So the most, the least amount of points you could have, you had four passes. It's like golf. You want a low score. Right. You had four passes on the grand FIDA plus the FIDA. So five points would have been perfect if you'd have won them all. And Dick knew he had to do something to keep me, like, focused because I was really confident going into the trials. And he said, uh, here's the deal. At that time, he had two kids, Kevin and Aaron. Still does, by the way. Mm -hmm. But at that time, they were both – Kevin was seven or eight. Mm -hmm. Aaron was Mm -hmm. four-ish. And he said, here's the deal. If you end up with more than seven points at the trials – you have to babysit my kids for the weekend while Diane and I have a little vacation. If you have seven points or less at the trials, I'll give you a hundred bucks. I was like, done. There's I'll an take incentive. that bet. Won the feed. By the way, by the way, lovely kids. Great, oh, absolutely. Great kids. Absolutely. But. But kids. <laughs> and I'm 26 at the 25, 26 You don't at the want time. any part of babysitting two no, kids. No. No. So, but a hundred bucks was pretty A hundred bucks was a lot of money. So. Won the FIDA, one point. Okay. Win the first pass, two points. Screw up the second pass, place third. Do you remember who beat you? Two people. Probably Rick and Daryl would be my <laughs> guess. So I placed third. So now I've got five points. Oh, you're right on the with, edge here. With two passes left, which means I have to win them both to finish on seven to win my 100 bucks. If I... Don't win the next two passes. It's a weekend of babysitting. It's a weekend of babysitting. I finished with seven points on the button. <laughs> nothing, got, like, nothing like an incentive. Exactly, and got my 100 bucks. So, I mean, that, but that's how well Dick knew me. I mean, he knew how to keep me focused and motivated and, and get me in the right place and mentally, physically. I mean, he, I mean, the guy is just unbelievable when it comes to that. Now, field archery. Awesome. Yeah, and and arguably an escape from the drudgery of target to a degree. Oh, absolutely. If you don't shoot field archery, you're crazy. It is the best thing for your target archery, bar none. And I loved it. Two-time world champion, so you must have loved it a lot. Yeah, I won 15 national titles too, but... Well, I didn't count that. (laughs) Yeah, it, it was awesome. And it wasn't like I practiced it a lot, but it was such a great break from target archery because you realized shooting up and down hills and your form feels so different and the execution can feel so different and you can shoot a shot that's not perfect and it still goes in the dot and when you realize that that it doesn't have to be perfect that you don't have to do everything exactly right and you can still shoot good arrows it makes target archery so much easier Mm -hmm. and it takes the pressure off because it doesn't have to be perfect i won lots of tournaments just shooting good arrows they don't have to be perfect arrows and field archery just plus you have to think a lot more because where's the sun and what's the slope and which is it off camber left or right and is it uphill or downhill and how much do i have to take off and you know it's just so much you have to think about it's such a nice break from just standing on a big cow pasture and shooting arrows at a known distance it's a lot more fun yeah so it sounds like you would recommend field archery to any target archer who wants to really turn their game up a notch i absolutely would yeah so uh Field archery is something that's taken you to probably at least as many places around the world, more than 25 countries, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 37 at last count. There you go. That's that's more than 25. All, all because of archery. Yeah. And a lot of those were for field archery. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in Europe, it's, it's huge. Um, and the courses are phenomenal. Oh, yeah. They're just brilliant. It's nothing like what you shoot here in the States. No, unfortunately. I mean, you know, there's there's been a couple of uh, courses in the States. There was one in uh, Cedar City a few years ago, mm-hmm. and there was one, uh, arguably, uh, the one in uh, here in Utah had some challenging shots. Well, Cedar yeah. City is in Utah. No, I meant the other one in Utah. <laughs> Sorry. The one in Roosevelt, Utah. Yes. But other than that, uh, yeah, lots of golf course type field courses. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty. And, you know, the NA, NFAA, you know, has some great courses. But And there's a few of them that have some up and down stuff. But 
Nothing you have to rope in for. Correct. And I've shot in the world championships, and they've they've dummied it down a little bit in the last probably 15 years. But when I first started shooting them back in 86, one of the first one, well, the first one I shot in Austria, there was one shot that was 58 degrees uphill. And if you want to know what that feels like, stand with your foot touching the foundation of your house and try to shoot the eave over your head. And that's about 58 degrees. I mean, it's almost vertical. And so Americans that shoot courses around here have no idea what angles really are about. Don't want to miss the target because it might get you coming back. Yeah, they they think they do. And a lot of the guys in the first few world fields I was at, a lot of the NFA guys, when compound first came in, a lot of the top NFAA shooters would, you know, make the team and then go over there. And we were trying to tell them what it's going to be like. And they all, oh, well, I shoot Darrington or I shoot this or I shoot that. And then they get over there and they come off the course talking to themselves like – Mike Leiter was my roommate at one of the first world fields with compounds. Great shooter, great target guy, great yeah. field guy. But And he was just like, oh, my God, I had no idea what you – I go, eh, I wasn't lying to you, you know. Yeah, we're talking early 90s here. Yes. So you've won the Olympic gold medal in 88. You've uh, reached the pinnacle of what a lot of people would consider to be, you know, the ultimate sporting challenge, and uh, and for good reason. You go out the following year and you win the world field. Or was it two years later? Two years. Two years later. Yeah. You, what, what kept that fire going? It's fun to win. Because most people, you know, they go and they win the Olympic gold medal, and that's often the last you hear from them. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I just love to shoot arrows. I, I do. I mean, right now, if somebody would tell me they pay me what I make right now in my real job to go back and shoot arrows, I would pick up my bow tomorrow and start shooting. I mean, I truly miss it i really miss competing and i I even miss practicing i like to stand there and fling arrows i I have seen you at the archery center quite a bit in the last you know yeah i'm coaching a few people and so it you know it helps to still know how to shoot an arrow once in a while but yeah yeah, i mean i don't have any calluses on my fingers and i i shake like there's an earthquake going off and i can't hit anything anymore but well the last part's not quite true i've seen the basics are the basics and knowing what they are helps me when i coach some of the guys i coach so so field archery and then Another run at the Olympic Games, 92, Barcelona. Yes. Arguably um, a tough games by by any measure because of uh, the new round. The new round took some getting used to. Yep, they had switched the head-to-head, uh, 18 arrow matches, total score, and then when you got down to the quarterfinals, I think it went to 12 arrow matches. That's right, yeah. So it was a, a different experience than what you had uh, done in 88, and it was not, not the easiest thing, and... And, and that's where we first saw the trend of people who didn't necessarily qualify at the top moving up the ladder and winning at the end. That was Sebastian Flute. I think he was 13th or so yeah. when he qualified. He just nined him to death. Yeah, which, you know, it's even in a short round, consistency still matters. He was consistent. He was in the <laughs> gold. Know? I mean, consistency you know, matters. That, and that last, that last, uh, that last pass that he had against his Korean opponent... I don't believe had an arrow out of the gold, but it didn't have more than one or two tens. Yeah, I was out of it by then, so I wasn't watching all that close. <laughs> you, were, you were at the uh, tapas bar down the road. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but uh, you didn't. Uh, you didn't finish your shooting career with and your second. And just to be Olympics. clear, you yeah. said tapas. 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 Not topless. The Spanish food. Thank you. Just want to yes. make that clear in case somebody wasn't listening close. That's an excellent point. Thank you for. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know if Janet listens to podcasts, but Janet, tapas bar. Anyway, the uh, (laughs) – talk about going off in the weeds. Um, (laughs) You still, you know, stayed as a force in target archery and in in field archery through the 90s, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know – in 93. But you started working for a living not Right, in too 93. Long after this. So after the 92 games, I finally went back and finished my degree because um, I promised my mother I would. And then. Started working for Easton. Jim Easton offered me a position at uh, doing promotions at, uh, at Easton. In Salt Lake City. In Salt Lake City. So I moved up here and had a real job, you know, 40 plus hours a week plus. A lot of plus. All the weekends and, you know, because I was the promotions guy. So yeah, so a, you had to go to all the trade shows and, right. and all the 3D events and all that stuff that, that people don't know goes on behind the scenes for... Yeah, so that uh, definitely cuts into your archery game. Sure. Um, but, I mean, I managed to stay competitive. Uh, 2001, the World Games, which was a field 
In Akita, Japan. In Akita, Japan. I managed to beat Fran Geely. He was the number one archer in the world at the time. I won the gold medal there, beat him, which was a total out of nowhere. <laughs> Where did the old guy come from? But So that was my last major thing. Um, and after that, it was uh, pretty much over. But, yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate to stay competitive for as long as I did. I think it was in 99 when you and I finished one and two at the national field. I believe so. Yeah. Something like that. You, as I recall, you beat me by well over 10 points. Yes. Like, well over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, there was first place, and then somewhere off in the distance was second place. And third place was even behind that. So, yeah, I, I've never beaten you in a field or any other uh, target archery challenge. I, I, uh, I don't know if I ever will. Oh, I don't know. But it's a lot of fun shooting with you. It is. I do enjoy it. So that's actually one of the aspects of J-Bars that I think a lot of people miss on the field of play when, uh, when they talk about uh, what things were like. It's, it's uh, your storytelling ability and the fact that you, <laughs> that you uh, always have something to say during the course of the event. But, but all joking aside, that was a technique or staying focused during the time you had to stay focused. Well, yeah, again, just like playing the music or, you know, screwing around with your buddies, there's no to me there's no reason to try to stay focused the whole time you're on the field cuz you just can't. So you might as well forget about it, put your mind on something else, and then that keeps you fresh so when it is time for you to shoot, then you can turn that on and go focus. You have to learn how to do that to be able to put everything else out of the way and then focus once you step on the line. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do that, so I was able to save a lot of mental energy because I'm not burning it all day long trying to be f focused. I would say that um, one of the unique aspects of, of what you bring to our sport, though, is the fact that you've always been super confident but not arrogant. You know? Yeah, I mean, the way I always explain it is you have to, anybody that's the best in the world at what they do is cocky not arrogant. And people go, oh, well, you shouldn't be cocky. Well, wait, wait, let, let me explain what my definition of cocky is. Cocky is a person who has self-confidence, who absolutely knows when they walk in, I'm the best guy here and I'm going to win this tournament. Whether they do or not, that's what you should be thinking. You could argue that that's what Rick was back when he told you guys that none of you are going to beat me. That's what Daryl was. Again, anybody that's the best at what they do, you have to be cocky. And that's that self-assured I know I'm good at this, and I know I can do this. Arrogant is when you're going to tell people about it. Mm -hmm. Cocky guy doesn't say anything. He just walks in with that attitude in his own mind of, I'm here to win this thing, and I know I can do it. He's the quiet guy in the corner of the bar. Right. The arrogant guy is the one that's mouthing off and telling everybody how great he's shooting and all that kind of stuff, and he's being a jerk. You don't need to be that guy. Today, you see that on social media quite a lot. Well, it's easy to be arrogant when you're not face-to-face -face with somebody. It's easy to be brave when you don't have to f stand there and talk to somebody. Uh, I don't have a lot of respect for that. But to have that self-confidence, that cockiness, you absolutely have to have that. Yeah. And, again, it's semantics about what you want. You can call it confident or you can call it whatever. I like to call it cocky because you got that little bit of swagger. Even if it's just in your own mind, you have to have that. You have to believe. If you don't believe in yourself, nobody else is. You have to believe in yourself to be good at something. You have to. It doesn't matter what it is. Here comes a shot out of left field here. I'd like to know how you feel about the path that things are on right now with the set system and how you feel about um, the overall event management, that kind of thing, you know, how, how tournaments are conducted today. And I'll, and I'll put this in context just real quick. You're coaching now. You're coaching members of the Canadian team. You're... you're going to events occasionally you're you know you're you're sharing with uh team members your knowledge base so i'm going to put you on the spot and ask you what what do you think of the set system and what do you think of the way the round is done it, the round is the round it doesn't matter if it's one error at a thousand yards or if it's the sets or if it's a double feed you have to be the best at whatever they put in front of you so you better like it um the set system for the spectators I think is a little more, could be more confusing than just adding up score. However, they do a good enough job of explaining it. I think it works great. Um, and I think it does give the archers a little less pressure of if I shoot one bad arrow, I'm not completely out of the tournament. 
you can look at that as a good thing or a bad thing. Sure. You know, I mean, if you're used to shooting the 12 arrow head to head match and you shoot one bad arrow, yeah, you're done. And that was part of the system and that was part of the round. And that's, you just had to learn to love that with this. It does take a little bit of the fluke factor out of it. Um, but every time something changes, everybody wants to compare it back to the old way. And, you know, what I tell people that don't like the head to head and they say, Oh, it doesn't choose a choose champion because you're not shooting 144 arrows or, you know, I go think of it the opposite way. If all you had ever done is shoot head to head matches, that's all that had ever been around. That's all you knew was head to head matches. And then somebody came along and said, what we're going to do is we're going to take four days. We're going to shoot 288 arrows at four different distances and add up the total score. Your arguments would be, well, that doesn't prove who's the best because there's no pressure and you can just get on a roll and you have all this time and there's 288 arrows and there's no pressure there. And it doesn't prove who the best archer is because the best archer is a guy that can shoot, you know, three arrows at a time and beat this guy, get six points. So your argument would just be the opposite. So whatever the round is, you just need to love that round and embrace it. And I think the set system is exciting to watch. I think the spectators dig it. Um, you know, I don't know about the archers. Most of them seem to like it. And, you know, it's working. And if it's working, that's great. We've covered a lot of years looking at... Uh, looking at. <laughs> yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. But That was one of the saddest days of my life, by the way, when I get a call from George in September a few years ago and he goes i answered the phone i'm like hey george what's going on he goes hey happy 25th anniversary winning your gold medal and my knees buckled i'm like oh my lord it has been 25 years i didn't mean to be mean about it appreciate you pal you're welcome well we're about the same age within about three weeks no no you are three weeks older than me my friend i'm looking at it as we're about the same age within about three weeks you older you are older (laughs) but i don't act it all right, so today you're you're you know for for the last I don't know decade or so you were always getting ready for one tournament. I was never getting ready for it. Okay, you were always the only tournament going through I the motions of getting ready Las to shoot Vegas. Vegas. Okay, because Vegas is the one opportunity that I think we all have to see everybody we know in A our sport. A lot of folks. Yep, and it's the weekend in Vegas, and it's only thirty arrows a day, and I have shot it. 36 years in a row so that's the only reason i kept shooting it was i had a string going yeah i I think you still got a ways to catch ed eliason but uh no actually it's uh it's uh jake oh from jake's archer jake sure jacob jacobson yep jake jacobson yeah he shot it every year since like 64 and the last he was the last guy to win vegas in the pro category with a recurve bow he was shooting a release recurve and a release but he was shooting a recurve yes 1974 if i'm not mistaken that is a fact so pretty remarkable and, and he lives you know just down the road here about 30 minutes down the road from from where we are sitting here in uh, just south of salt lake city in the casa del bar's backyard casa de bar ski chalet and home for wayward archers home for wayward archers uh for example when the canadian team's in town there's a canadian flag flying outside the house and it's funny because you've got a bigger collection of flags, I think, than some of the World Cup organizers <laughs> have. Well, if you stay at my house, if you spend the night, I fly either your country or your state flag. So if you're from the U.S., that's a pretty I cool. Go get your state flag, and I fly that. See, I, I kind of like that. That's a nice tradition. That's something that uh, Joe Johnston uh, started doing that, and uh, when he the, was president of Hoyt. Yep. And uh, I came over to his house one time to stay, and and uh, he was flying the Olympic flag. So I asked him about it, and I thought, wow. One day when I own a house, I'll do that. So that's what I've done. Yeah, nice tradition. But you're, you know, you're shooting more lately. I've noticed that because we have the Archery Center, our our beautiful twelve million dollar Easton Foundations Archery Center, uh, not too far away from the office uh, for myself. And you're working in another business these days, but um, it's a great facility to have. The company's oh, building, or, or Jim and and Greg are building more of those. Uh, they are about to open one in San Diego in October. So it's a great opportunity, and you're taking advantage of it a little bit. You're actually going out there and shooting a lot more than I used to see you. Well, a lot more means once a month, so Okay, yes, but that's, that's a lot a, more. <laughs> that's a lot more, yeah. So what are you working on when you're shooting now? You know, it's the same stuff. You're just trying to make sure the form's still there and all the parts are in the right places and the execution. You know, I was more of a feel shooter. I didn't... I mean, you need to learn the technical part of it, and Dick taught me where the parts should be and how it should feel. And once you learn how it feels and, and you get to a certain level of competency, then it is about feel. It's about trying to execute a shot and make it feel a certain way. 
you know, the shot happens too quick to try to do it A, B, C, D. It can't be mechanical. It has to be about a feel. And the more feel you use and the more it becomes an art and less a science, that's when you shoot your best. Now, you and I are from a certain era. And in that era, there were certain equipment fundamentals that were a little different than what we're seeing right now. Mostly in mass weight of the bow, I would say. You and I would generally prefer, you you generally prefer, a lower mass weight bow. You're shooting, you know, 50-something pounds originally. No, I was shooting about 48. 48. Yeah. But you were shooting a bow that weighed less than the typical bow that we see today from the mass weight standpoint. You didn't have a big, huge stack of stabilizer weights no, like I think we see my from bow, Brady. My bow, if you weighed the entire bow, weighed like six, six and a half pounds. Yeah, and some bows are pushing nine yeah. now. Well, they're bigger boys than me then because I didn't shoot that heavy a weight. But what's your what's your basic philosophy there? I've talked to Daryl Pace about this, and back in the day, Daryl's philosophy was keep the bow lightweight so that you can move it if you get pushed by the wind. Well, I mean, back then, bows were lighter. Um, so that part of it is that. But my thing was I wanted it to be heavy enough that it would resist the wind a little bit, but light enough that when I got blown off, I could get it back. And I noticed if I got the mass weight up, heavier that when I got pushed off, it took me too long to get it back to the target. Yeah, same thing Daryl said. Um, so by having a lighter bow, I just had more control over it because the wind's going to move it and the wind's going to move you. No matter how your bow could weigh 100 pounds, it's still going to push you. So I, uh, there was a point there where if it got too heavy, one, it was just harder to hold up, and yeah. two, it was harder to get back on the target. So I wanted it to be more nimble and be able to get it back on the target because the wind was going to push it anyway. So your students today, um, people like Jay Lyon from Canada, uh, what what have you got them working on in, in general? Without giving away any secrets, if uh, there are any. Yeah, the secrets are there are no secrets. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, every student is different. You know, Hugh McDonald is different than what Jay's working on, is different than what Tyler is working on, the kid that I coach here. Um, you know, it just depends on what that particular archer is is working on, but it's – you know, the, the thing that Dick always beat into my head was focus, rhythm, and timing. And if your rhythm and timing are good, you're almost always going to shoot good arrows. If you watch the top guys, the guys that are winning, their rhythm and timing are impeccable. And if it's not good, that's generally not a good shot. At that level, they can get away with it occasionally. But on average, rhythm and timing, rhythm and timing. So it's a lot of that. And then your form is always under flux because with archery, it, Things change. They slowly change, like a golf swing. There's always going to be something creeping out. And as a coach, it's just a matter of, you know, seeing what that is and then putting it back in the right place. Um, you know, so it's it's nothing earth-shattering. It's pretty much just basic archery. Let's wrap up by talking about the people who might be out there listening to this right now who think to themselves, boy, I really, you know, it might be too late to get ready for Rio, but I want to put a plan together for going to Tokyo in 2020. Where does a plan like that start? Well, it starts with, I want to win the gold medal in Tokyo in 2020, and that becomes your ultimate goal, and then you work backwards. What are the things I have to do to get there? Well, to win the gold medal in Tokyo in 2020, I have to make my country's Olympic team. So that becomes the next thing. Well, to make the Olympic team, it'd probably be nice to have shot well at a world championship, so I want to medal at a world championship. Well, to medal at a world championship, you have to make a world team, so I want to make a world team. Well, to make a world team, it probably would have been nice to medal at a national championship. So I want to medal at a national championship. Well, to do that, you have to do, and then you just keep working it back until where you're standing right now, which may get to, I need to shoot 300 arrows a day. And Dick says it takes about six years. From zero, yeah. From zero. Yeah. Um, that's not four to six years. That's very, I think, a very accurate time frame. Um but you work your way backwards and you set those goals and those milestones. And some of them are, you know, self-limiting and that there's going to be an Olympic trials at this time, whether you're ready or not. And some of them are, I want to shoot a score of this and there may or may not be a time limit to it. Um, and you just work your way backwards to that. And then you have to decide, do I have the time and the ability to do all those things? And if you don't, then don't kid yourself. Um, you know, don't frustrate yourself by trying to, win an Olympic gold medal when you've only got time to shoot 15 minutes a day, three days a week. That's, it's not going to happen. Change your goal to, I want to be my club champion or I want to be a state champion or I want to be, you know, a regional champion. But if you don't have the time to devote 
to this and to be an Olympic champion even more now than when I was, it's full time. All Brady and those guys do is shoot arrows. That's it. That's their job. And in a normal trials process, the people who get selected for a team are the ones who've put in that kind of time. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not like you're going to go there if you've never shot at that level and shoot at that level for however many tournaments the trials process is now. You're you're competing with guys that their full-time job is to shoot arrows. Period. And if you can't devote that time to it, then don't frustrate yourself and, and bang your head against that wall. Set a different goal. Be the club champion. Be the state champion. Be a regional champion. Be, you know, whatever. Shoot a better score today than you did yesterday. You know, I play golf. I'm a six, seven handicap on a good day. I have no thought of ever being much better than that. But every day I go out, I want to shoot one stroke better than I did the day before. And I have just as much fun and it's just as stimulating and just as exciting and just as frustrating and as it is, I'm sure, for the pros. And I'll never play in a tournament anywhere close to that. So archery can be the same thing. Just try to be better tomorrow than you were today. If you don't have that time and that ability to dedicate that to be an Olympic champion or world champion. And you'll still enjoy it. Bottom line is do what you can with the time that you have and maximize your time to try to enjoy your sport as much as you can. And, and if, it, if you can enjoy it like you used to when you were shooting out there every day, if you didn't enjoy it, you wouldn't have done it. Well, exactly then it can take you places. Absolutely. And, you know, setting a goal of whatever, a stretch goal, a goal, out, you know, even if you don't reach it, you will probably get so much farther down that road and accomplish things so much bigger than you ever thought you would had you not set that goal. So why not? I think that'll wrap it up for our uh, brief interview with Jay Bars, 1988 Olympic gold medalist. Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts. And uh, as we get closer to the Rio Olympic Games, I'd like to have you back for your observations of what's going on and uh, spend some time on that subject. Anytime. I really enjoyed it, George. Jay Bars, Olympic gold medalist. Thank you for joining us on the Easton Podcast. Uh, Again, if you've got questions, uh, follow-up questions for Jay or any other topics that have come up on our podcast, you can address those directly to us. With our just podcast. write your request on a $50 bill and send it to J-Bars. No, yes, directly. <laughs> or you can just email us. It's cheaper and faster. Much cheaper. It's podcast at eastontp.com. Easton Technical Products is Easton TP. So it's podcast at eastontp.com. For the Easton Podcast, I'm George Tekmachev. Thanks for joining us.